Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. I pray that our time of study together will be refreshing and a beneficial time for everyone in Jesus' name. Well, stand up as we pray together. Thank you very much. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study tonight. Thank you, Lord, because this is the first month of this new year. And you have gathered us together for a good purpose to gather around this book that never grows old. And it's the book of the Father's love. Revealing your mind, your will, your wisdom to every one of us. And Lord, we pray this year, this book will guide and control our lives in Jesus' name. And we pray that great, great things will happen in our lives. We'll be able to sing glory, hallelujah, to the Lord because of the contents of the book this year in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, as we study, you'll grant us the key, the understanding, the proper interpretation, application of the word to every one of us so that, Lord, our lives will never be the same again. As we walk through life, we'll walk with this book in our hand, this book in our heart, this book in our mouth, this book in our actions, and it will lead us to succeed all through our lives in Jesus' name. Once again, give us the key tonight, the key of interpretation and of application of the word, that this word will show us the way. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Tonight, as we come to a Bible study, we're continuing the Sermon on the Mount. We've been in chapter 5. The word is so great and so deep. And it's so wide in its application. We're now in chapter 5 of Matthew, verses 17 and 18. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, till heaven and earth pass, one judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Here the Lord is telling us about the permanence of the word. The preeminence of the word. The Lord is telling us here that till earth and heaven shall pass. Not one judge. Not one teacher. You can say when you write the letters of the alphabet. Or you write a big volume. It says the dot of an I will not be missing. And the cross of a T will not be missing. No matter how big the volume might be. That's what he means by saying. Not one judge or teacher shall pass from the law. Or the prophets. That he is from the word of God. Until all be fulfilled he said think not think not that i am come to destroy the law why did he say think not because everything you do depends on what you think if you think christ has come to destroy the law and the prophets and you happen to be a follower of jesus christ and that's the way you are thinking that now Christ has come. He has destroyed the law and the prophets as a disciple of Christ. If that's the way you think, you'll act that way. No law. No rule and regulation. No standard for living. And there is no measure of how to act and how to live. After all, there is no law. Because Christ, our Savior, our Lord, has come to destroy the law and the prophets. Said, think not. That I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. You see, our lives depend on how we think and what we think. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 23. 
Verse 7. Proverbs chapter 23. We're reading from verse 7. Here in the first part of that verse, here is what it says. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so will his language be, his heart be, his life be, his attitude be, his actions be. And so Jesus said, don't think I have come to destroy the law and then become lawless. You see the people that were in the time of Jesus Christ, they didn't understand why Christ came. They didn't really understand the full authority and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ when he came. That's why he had to tell them what not to think. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, we're looking at verse 9. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 9. Here John was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. And think not to say within yourselves. Think not to say. You see what you think matters a lot. When you look at a situation. And when you look at the teaching of the word of God. If you think a particular way. Of that teaching. Of that doctrine. Your action. Your behavior. Will relate to how you think. That's why John said. Think not to say within yourselves. We have Abraham to our father. You see, if they thought like that, we have Abraham to our father. Whatever we do, Abraham is our father. Wherever we go, Abraham is our father. However we act, Abraham is our father. And John said, don't think like that. It will make you feel that all responsibility is over. It will make you to think that uh, there is no responsibility on you at all because Abraham is our father. And because he was faithful to God, his faithfulness will come on us automatically and naturally think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down, is cut down. Sons and daughters of Abraham, think right. Then you will act right. Think right. Then you will walk right. Think right. Then you will live right. Because if you just think we're children of Abraham, we're the sons and the daughters of Abraham. Therefore, all responsibility is on Abraham. And it doesn't matter what we do. And it doesn't matter whether we're bringing forth fruit unto repentance and righteousness or not. Because we're Abraham's children. He says, therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. He tells us then the importance of thinking. Think not. Esther chapter 4. In Esther chapter 4, we're reading from verse 3. Sorry, verse 13. Esther chapter 4, verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself. Hey, you see what, what we're reading in the Bible? Think not. Esther, there you are. The Jews are in trouble. And the Jews are about to be killed, destroyed, exterminated, wiped out from the face of the earth. And you think you have security. And you are there in the palace of the king. And you are thinking within yourself, I am secured. Esther, you, are, you feel you are secured and you are at ease. You don't feel any danger at all because of the way you think. You think there's no problem, there's no trouble. I am the queen, the wife of the king. And therefore, even though I belong to the race of the Jews, there is no danger for me. Think not like that, Esther. You see, if we think like that, we'll not rise up to the challenge of the day. If we think like that, we'll not rise up to our responsibility. If we think like that, we'll think others are in danger, but I am secured. That's why Mordecai said, 
Esther think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. What we seek determines our action, determines our behavior, determines our lifestyle. Think not like you are thinking. Then it says in verse 14, For if thou altogether hold thy peace at this time, if the way you think makes you to fold your hand, close your mouth, and just sit down, and you don't rise up to the challenge of the day because of the way you think, if you are thinking because I'm secure, I don't care what happens to the people of God. If that's the way you are thinking, that makes you lazy, that makes you, you know, that makes you quiet and not do anything. It says at this time, then salvation, then deliverance shall arise. And enlightenment and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. Think not, Esther. If you think the way you are thinking. And then you sit back and you do not do anything and rise to the challenge of the day. The people of God will still be enlarged and the people of God will still be delivered. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth Esther, whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We're looking, we have looked at those words, think not, very important. That's what Jesus Christ emphasized it. He said, now my disciples, all those, who are, all those who are listening to me, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And that shows us something. Our Lord's authority did not contradict or cancel. The authority of the scriptures. He upheld the scriptures. The permanence of the scriptures. The preeminence of the scripture. His message and God's written word are inseparable. As God does not change, the Lord Jesus Christ informs us that the word of God does not change. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. In Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. I am the Lord, my word does not change. My plan does not change. My ability does not change. I am the Lord, I change not. Because it does not change, his nature does not change. His vision does not change. His wisdom does not change. His knowledge, his understanding, his will does not change. Because of that, his word will not change. Now when it says, come back to Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. The law. When it says the law, there are three senses, three ways in which the New Testament uses the word the law. The law. Number one, in a very limited sense, the Ten Commandments. It says, do not ever imagine in your mind. Do not ever think that I have come to destroy the law. The Ten Commandments. For you to know that the law is sometimes used in that limited sense. Let's look at Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Reading from verse 8. In Romans chapter 13, reading verse 8, here is what it says. Oh, no man, anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. You see, the law is used in that sense. The moral law. The law that controls our behavior. Our relationship, our interaction one with another. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. You see that now. It's quoting from the Ten Commandments. And thou shalt not kill, part of the Ten Commandments. And thou shalt not steal. And thou shalt, bear, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment among the Ten Commandments, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You see then, the law is used for the Ten Commandments. Look at James chapter 2. 
When it says, I have not come to destroy the law. I have not come to destroy the moral law. Are you a disciple of Christ? The moral law is still there. It's not destroyed. It is not annulled. It is not taken out of the way. Otherwise, will be lawless. Otherwise, will be immoral. Otherwise, will be unrighteous. The law is still there. The Ten Commandments are still there. The moral law is still binding upon people. It tells us in James chapter 2 verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well, but if ye have respect of persons, ye commit sin. And are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law. And yet offend in one point. Is guilty of all. He's talking about the law now. And this is what Jesus said. Never think. Don't think for a moment, for a minute. For a passing instant. That I have come to destroy the law. No, that cannot be. How can Christ be lawless? How can Christ, our Savior from sin, encourage lawlessness? Think not within yourselves that Christ, our Savior and Lord, has come to destroy the moral law. He says, no, I have not come to destroy. I have come to fulfill. And he tells us in verse 11, For he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. He's now quoting from the Ten Commandments. Therefore, we understand when it says the law, the basic meaning, in the strictest sense, in the lowest sense, is that he's talking about the Ten Commandments. But number two, he's also talking about what we call the judicial law. The judicial law. You see, Israel as a nation at the judiciary. And then those people in the judiciary, they, they govern one another. And when somebody has committed a crime in society, there are laws that bind us together as a citizens. And then that person will be examined. When that person is examined, if he's guilty of imprisonment, he'll be in prison. That's the judiciary. And therefore Jesus said, I come to the nation. Think not that I have come to destroy the judicial law. Otherwise, how will there be peace in your society? I have not come to destroy, but I have come to have come to fulfill. And let's look at John chapter 7. In John chapter 7. We're reading from verse, we're reading from verse 49. But these people knoweth not the law because they know not the law they are cursed but these people who knoweth not the law are cursed Nicodemus says unto them that he that came to Jesus by night being one of them does our law judge any man does our law judge any man before it hear him and knoweth what he doeth are we not going to go through the process of the judiciary and then examine the man, interrogate him, interview him, find out whether he is guilty or not before we condemn him? That's the law. That's the law. The judicial law. And then number three, there is, this, uh, there is a ceremonial law. Actually, the sacrificial law. Which law is that? The law of sacrifices. That uh, you read all of that in Leviticus, where a sinner, a transgressor, will take a lamb. And when he takes that lamb, he lays hands on that lamb and confesses all his sins. And then that lamb will be taken away for sacrifice. And because that the sins have been confessed on the lamb, and, they, and that lamb now is killed and, and slain, it has borne away the iniquity of that individual. And then Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy that. I came to fulfill it. And that's why John said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He came to fulfill the moral law, not to destroy it. 
He came to fulfill the judicial law. Not to ful no, he came to fulfill, not to destroy. And he came to fulfill the sacrificial ceremonial law, not to destroy. Come back now to Matthew chapter 5. As we look at Matthew chapter 5, tonight we're looking at the permanence of God's word. The word is permanent. And the word is preeminent. And this is why Jesus said, think not. That I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And then he said, for verily, that's the word of authority. It's the one that I use that very more. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Verily, I say unto you. Till heaven and earth pass. One judge or one title shall in no wise pass from the law. Till all be fulfilled tonight we divide the message to three parts number one confirmed finality of god's word the confirmed finality of god's word number two christ's fulfillment of god's word christ's fulfillment of God's word. Number three, Christians' faithfulness to God's word. Let's come to number one, confirmed finality of God's word. The Lord Jesus Christ put a final seal of approval on the word of God. He said in uh, chapter 5, verse 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill i am not come to destroy but to fulfill now the first question is this what's the law and when we say the law and the prophets what is the implication of that the law and the prophets actually when it says the law or the prophets or the law and the prophets it's referring to the whole of the old testament when he uses all that together, the law, the first five books of Moses, and then the prophets, the rest of the Old Testament. Hey, look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 13. Matthew 11, reading from verse 13, the terminology, the law or the prophets, or sometimes just basically the law, or sometimes the law and the prophets in matthew chapter 11 verse 13 it says for all the prophets and the law prophesied until john all the prophets and the law it is putting everything together from genesis to malachi all the prophets and all and the law they prophesied until john and then we're looking at matthew chapter 22 the terminology the law or the prophets the law and the prophets it's the whole of the Old Testament. In Matthew chapter 22, reading from verse 36. Matthew 22, verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Which is the great commandment in the law? In verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. And with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The Lord Jesus Christ was saying, I think about all the messages that uh, Moses gave. All the laws that he wrote down, you can put everything on this. Uh, you can say all these commandments, they are just basically like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. The moral law, uh, that just it. The moral law, the Ten Commandments, you can summarize them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. The judicial law that judicial law that is the penalty for contradicting contravening the moral law is still upholding love to god and love to humanity that when you do not show that concern that consideration and then you are selfish you are selfish to the point that you steal from another person because of breaking the law of love that's why you have the judiciary and then the sacrificial law 
Why would a lamb be killed? Because somebody did not show that love. Love to God and love to man. And because of contradicted that love to God and love to man, that's why a sacrifice is necessary. That's why Jesus said, all the law and the prophets, they hang on this basic sin. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. John chapter 1. We're looking at uh, that terminology, the law or the prophets, the law and the prophets, what it simply means, the whole of the Old Testament. John chapter 1, verse 45. Philip findeth Nathanael and said unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Moses wrote about him. And the prophets wrote about him. He's combining all of the Old Testament together. And he said, we have found him. Acts of the Apostles chapter 13, verse 15. Acts chapter 13, verse 15. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. It's just like when we come over here and we do a Bible reading. The Bible reading could be from the New Testament or Old Testament because now we have the whole thing together. In their own case, they add only the law and the prophets. That's the whole of the Old Testament. And when they came to their synagogue or sanctuary, before anybody will give a word of exhortation, they'll have that Bible reading. And then after they have read, out of the law and the prophets, then they say to the people, brethren, if you have any word of exhortation, say on. That means then, when we mention the law or the prophets, we're actually referring to the whole of the Old Testament. Now, let's come to this confirmation by the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the finality of that Old Testament. Confirmed finality of God's word. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets That is if you read it now properly Think not that I am come to destroy the Old Testament I am not come to destroy but to fulfill For verily I say unto you Till heaven and earth pass One judge or one teacher Shall in no wise pass from the law From the Old Testament Till all be fulfilled That finality That Jesus Christ mentioned This word of God That still controls us today the word of God that still directs our past today. The word of God that still brings conviction today. The word of God that still brings cleansing and directs our past in the way of righteousness today. It has a final, it has a finality of was age. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24 verse 35. Matthew chapter 24 verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Many people think that the earth, because it's very solid, the globe, because it's very solid, they think it has a finality to it. They, they think nothing can destroy, nothing can move it out of the way. It says, even though you are thinking that the earth is reached its finality, Yet you need to understand the word of God and the words of Christ. They have greater finality than the earth and than the universe, than the sky, than, than heaven. That's why it says that heaven and earth shall pass away. It's not as settled, as stable, as solid as you think. But it says, but my words shall not pass away. There's no modification to the word. There is no change of the word. And there is, uh, there is no adjustment editing of the word. There is no taking away from the word. There is no addition to the word. Christ confirmed the finality of this word of God. As God is eternal, his word is eternal. 
As God is infallible, his word is infallible. There's no fault, there's no error, there's no mistake in it. And as God is there steadfast from eternity to eternity, so the word of God is steadfast and established forever. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 15, here is what the word of God is telling us. And notice the very first word of that verse 16. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says, all scripture, all, no exception. The Old Testament. And now with the New Testament, every part of that Old Testament, the shortest verse and the longest verse. The shortest book and the longest book. Every chapter, every word, every sentence there, every instruction there, every commandment there, every prophecy there, every promise there, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All is profitable. All. The Old Testament is profitable from Genesis to Malachi. The Old Testament is profitable. Even Leviticus, when you cannot understand. The Old Testament is profitable. Well, the book of Job and the book of and the book of the Psalms and the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and even the songs of songs, the song of Solomon, that you may not fully understand until we begin to study it and interpret it. The message of God to the people. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. It's for profitable for doctrine. And for reproof. And for correction. And for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. It says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. More sure word of prophecy. Surer than the philosophies of the philosophers. Surer than the psychology of the psychologists. Surer than the history of the world. It's surer. We have a more sure word of prophecy. More than the opinions of men. More than the news you hear. More than the current events. This is a more sure word of prophecy than any other thing. This is greater than dreams. This is more, this is uh, more solid than the revelations and the visions of men. This is greater than what the people in any assembly, in any place, in any fellowship that are not saying the Lord. All the prophecies they are giving today, all the revelations they are giving today. It says we have a more sure word of prophecy that this word of God is greater than any other thing you can hear. Greater than the opinions of men. Greater than the scientific discoveries of men. This is revelation from on high. And it says we have a more sure word of prophecy. What does, it, what does that mean? Put all the books of the world together. Every book you can find in the world. Every book in every library. Every book in every school. Every book with anyone. All the information, the data you have on the computer. Everything you can download from the internet. All the information you have. All the knowledge you have. All the writings of me you have. The greatest of the historians and the greatest of the philosophers and the greatest of the religionists and the greatest of all the people that have all these proverbs put everything together and put them on one side it will be a great great pile and then put the bible on the other on the other side this word one, one single bible the word of god this bible will be greater than all those books of the world put together as you think about the Bible, 
reaching within those few years and then you think about all the knowledge that has come to the world here is the finality of god's word that when you put all the books of the world together that has been reaching up for thousands and thousands of years and the books that are still coming up today and then you put just the bible this single volume the whole bible in, on one side this bible is greater it's higher than them all when all those books are born to the flames of fire that will consume the world on the final day this book will still stand the bible stands and all it stands far above heads and shoulders above every opinion of man that's why it says we have in the bible in our hand we have in the authoritative word of God, we have a more sure word, a prophecy. That's why we ought to read it. That's why we ought to study it. That's why we ought to lay by it. That's why we ought to believe it. That's why we ought to act. That's why we ought to have confidence in it. A more sure word of prophecy. And then he tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 4. We're looking at verse 2. Still telling us. The final authority, the finality of this word. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word that I command you. It's final. If you have to add anything, that means it's not final. There's a finality of God's word. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, as if there's something unnecessary, as if there's something unimportant, as if there's something redundant, as if there is something superfluous that you can cut away from the word. It says, no, you are not to add unto it because it is complete. You are not to take anything away from it because, because it's final, it's sufficient. You cannot take even a letter away. The dot of an I, the cross of a T, because the Lord Jesus Christ said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the Lord from the world from God's word until all be fulfilled and then he tells us that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you in Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 32 Deuteronomy chapter 12 reading from verse 32 in verse 32 here is what it says what things soever I command you and it's in the word there's no commandment, eh, there's no other thing. Eh, this book contains commandments and promises and precepts and prophecies and parables and predictions and revelations. Everything, the mind of God. And it says, What's, what things soever I command you, observe to do it. Don't be looking at what can we sift out? What can we take out? What can we do without? Which part of it is redundant that we can take away? Which part can we neglect? Which part can we overlook without serious consequence? It says there's no part you can take away. Everything has a great consequence. There is no part you can overlook. There is no part you can say, I think I can do without that. No. It says what things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Proverbs chapter 30. In Proverbs chapter 30, I'm reading from verse 5 and verse 6. Proverbs chapter 30, reading verses 5 and 6. It says in verse 5, every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. You know, sometimes some of these uh, misguided people, they rise up, they say, hey, they want to give a revised version. But every word is pure already. How would you reverse, revise something that is pure and perfect? Sometimes they say they want to simplify the word of God. How do you simplify something that is pure and perfect? 
Sometimes they say they want to reveal God's word. It's like they're saying God did not have the wisdom, the intelligence to communicate very well. And they think that now man has come this far. We have learned a lot in communication now that we can communicate better than God. And because our communication is better than God now, we can edit, we can modify, we can simplify the communication of God. God says no. Who creates man? Who creates the brain? Who creates the ability to communicate? The one that has made mouths does he not know how to speak? The one who has given us speech, can he not talk? And the one who has given us understanding, can he not say what he means and then mean what he says? Therefore the Lord says in verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, we're reading from verse 89. Psalm 119, verse 89. It says in verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. If something is settled in heaven, how can it be changed on earth? If something is settled in heaven, how can people of just this little stature we see? And they, are not, they have not grown tall, as tall as the ceiling of their houses yet. And they are not ancient. Of, how can a pony man, a dying man, a man of temporary life, a man that is alive today and is dead tomorrow. How can he change the word of the ancient of days? What does he know? Everything man makes is breaking down. Everything man makes is, is uh, deteriorating. If he builds a house, the house is uh, dilapidating and collapsing after, after a few years. Even his body, within a few years, is crumbling. Even his brain is forgetful after a few years. And the cells of his body, they are dying. After a few years, the ancient of this, look at the world he made. It has been there for thousands of years and it's still remaining. Men are coming and going. They're living and dying and they're decaying. But you know God, what he makes is final. That's why he says, if I give that finality to the earth, how much more my word forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven thy faithfulness is unto all generations thou hast established the earth and it abides they continue this day according to thine ordinances for all are thy servants it tells us then in Revelation chapter 22 the finality of God's word confirmed finality Revelation chapter 22 verse 18 verse 19 for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these says. What does that mean? If anybody will become so proud as to exalt himself above the almighty God. If anybody will be so proud as to claim to be wiser than the almighty God. If anybody will be so proud as to say that he can correct God. He can put God straight. If anybody can be so bold and so proud as to say God is un unintelligent. He has not said what he ought to say. And therefore he with his puny brain, he with his little brain, he with his misguided opinion about himself. He will be so proud as to say I want to correct the almighty God. I want to add something that God forgot. My brain, my mind is greater than the intelligence of the Almighty God. If any man is that proud, he says, For I testify unto every man that hear the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto them, unto the sea, unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues, the sicknesses, the calamities, and the judgments that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away, what does that mean? If anybody will say, as I read this, what was God looking at that he put? This is unnecessary. 
If anybody will accuse God of being redundant, if anybody will accuse God of talking too much and saying, why did God say this? This is unnecessary. This is useless. This is worthless. We don't need this. If anybody will be so proud as to sit at a judge over the almighty God, I will say, almighty God, were you sleeping when you wrote this? Nobody needs this. What were you thinking about when you wrote this in the Bible? Nobody needs this. If anybody will sit as a judge on the judgment seat over God's word and accuse God of saying something he shouldn't have said and therefore he says, all right, God, since you are so forgetful, you don't know we don't need this, I take this away. I take that away. When you see it as a judge over the almighty God and his word like that, it says, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. You should understand that. If a child will look at the father that brought him into the world and say, father, you're stupid. You're foolish. You're unintelligent. What to say is not right. I cancel that. I remove that. I suppress that. That father has a right to drive that child out of his house. If any child will look to the father eyeball to eyeball and say, Father, you're un unintelligent. You don't know what you're talking about. That thing you said is wrong. I will correct you. That father has a right to eject that child out of his home. God, the creator, has the right to eject this fellow out of our eternal home. If any human being, a creature of God, will say, God, you're unintelligent, you're foolish, you're stupid. Why did you write this? I'm going to remove it. Uh, you cannot get to heaven when you're that audacious, that sinful, that rebellious against the word of God. There's a confirmed finality to God's word. That's why it says, and any man, if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Uh, what a commandment we have, what a challenge we have. We'll come to point number two. Christ's fulfillment of God's word. Christ's fulfillment of God's word. Uh, we'll come to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're reading from verse 17 and verse 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophet. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. As you think about it, those words of the Lord Jesus Christ have come to fulfill. That word, fulfill. Think about it. How Christ fulfilled the word. His conception was a fulfillment of the law and the prophets. According to Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. His birth, the place of his birth was a fulfillment that he'll be born in Bethlehem. That's in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. His life, the life he lived, it was a fulfillment of the Old Testament. And that you can read in Isaiah chapter 61. And then his miracle working ministry, Isaiah chapter 35, Isaiah chapter 61. Everything was fulfillment of, uh, the, of the Old Testament. His message in parables. Why are you talking to them in parables, Psalm 70, that it might be fulfilled what it was said? It was concerning him. Even his message they were the fulfillment of the of the prophets as well as the as the law and then the betrayal after he finished his ministry as judas betrayed him you'll find that in in psalm 22 it was a fulfillment of the old testament his burial as jonah was in the way in the whale's belly for three days and three nights even so the son of man shall be in the heart of the earth and then his resurrection it was according to the old testament 
Every detail of the life of Christ was a fulfillment of God's word. That's why he said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill and let's look at a few of the references in matthew chapter one the fulfillment the fulfillment of god's word by christ matthew chapter one verse 21 and she shall bring forth his son and thou shalt call his name jesus for he shall save his people from their sins now all this was done that it might be fulfilled that's the word all this the conception of christ all this was done that it may be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet which was uh, uh, which was spoken by the prophet saying behold the virgin shall be a child and shall bring forth his son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us and let's look at um, uh, chapter 8 of Matthew now we'll come to his life that and his ministry as well in Matthew chapter 8 verse 8 verse 16 when the even was come they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled that's the word that it might be fulfilled that's why Jesus Christ said think not that I am come to destroy to remove, to annul, to cancel, to contradict the law and the prophets. I have not come to destroy, I came to fulfill. And then as we look at his healing ministry, at his deliverance ministry, it says that it may be fulfilled, which was spoken by Jesus the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses. We're looking at chapter 13. Chapter 13 of Matthew, reading from verse 34 and verse 35, fulfillment. All these spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable speaking not unto them, that it might be fulfilled. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew chapter 26, from verse 47. Matthew chapter 40, 26, verse 47. And while he yet spake, Lo, Judas, one of the twelve came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, Wherefore art thou come? Then they and then and then they then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him and behold one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck his servant of the high priests and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him. Put up, up again thy sword into his place for all they that take the sword shall perish of the sword thinkest thou i cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels but how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled if i if i do that and escape the betrayal and the crucifixion how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be and you will see then that everything was in fulfillment of scripture let's look at uh, chapter 27 of matthew verse 9 matthew chapter 27 verse 9 then was fulfilled that which was spoken by jeremy uh, the prophet saying and they took the 30 pieces of silver and the, pri the price of him that was valued whom they of the children of israel did value even the 30 pieces of silver 
the value at which Jesus Christ was sold by Judas Iscariot. Even that was according to prophecy. Verse 34 and verse 35. Verse 34. They gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled. Every detail that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they, they cast lots. And then we're told in Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, reading from verse 25. Mark 15, verse 25. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the subscription of his accusation was written over, over, king of, king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two thieves, one on his right hand, and the other on, on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled. And the scripture was fulfilled. Even the crucifixion. And the circumstances of the crucifixion. It was a fulfillment of the scripture. It tells us in that verse. And the scripture was fulfilled. Which says he was numbered with the transgressors. And then we're told in Luke chapter 24. Now he, after he rose from the dead. And the disciples were wondering because they didn't understand. And Jesus appeared to his disciples. You know what we're looking from the scriptures? From his conception. To his birth. To his life. To his miracle ministry. To his messages. To the betrayal. And to the, to the crucifixion. The sacrifice of the lamb. And then the burial and the resurrection. Everything in detail in fulfillment of the scripture. That's why I said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. One judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the Lord till all be fulfilled. In Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And beginning at Moses, that's the law, and all the prophets, the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning him. Verse 44. In verse 44 it says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. All things, all details, all the words must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the, in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You see very clearly then how the scriptures make it very, very clear that Jesus Christ came to fulfill. He came to fulfill the law. And as I've explained already, the moral law he fulfilled perfectly. The judicial law, he fulfilled perfectly. And the law of sacrifices, the sacrificial law, he fulfilled perfectly. And because he did that, in fact, even now, the body of Christ, the body of Christ is still fulfilling the moral law. Because, you see, if Christ, the head, fulfilled the moral law, the body of Christ, the members of the body of Christ, living now in the strength of the Lord, in the grace of God, by the power of the Spirit of God, we go on fulfilling that same moral law. I, but the sacrificial law, no, he has put a finality, a stop, to the sacrifice of animals because it became the final Paschal lamb, the final sacrifice. Now we come to... And number three, Christian's faithfulness to God's word. Christian's faithfulness to God's word. We come to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 17. Think not what you think is very important. As you come to the Lord, now you are born again, now you are a child of God. What do you think? Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. 
Because if you think the laws are all destroyed, you'll be lawless. You'll be unrighteous. You'll be uncontrollable. You'll be ungovernable. You'll, be, you'll not be counseled and you'll not be directed. If you think he has come to destroy the law and the prophets, I am saved. And therefore the law is now useless and redundant. You are thinking the wrong way. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. And that's what the Lord is telling us. And he says in that verse 18, for verily, certainly, assuredly, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass one judge or one cheater shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled we christians are now to be faithful to the law and the prophets look at matthew chapter 7 matthew chapter 7 verse 12 Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you do ye even so to them that's the golden rule and if everybody realizes that salesmen realize that if you're selling something that is uh, worthless at a high price you won't want anybody to do that to you and what things soever all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you do ye even so unto them Parents and children, the way you act to your children, if you were the children and your children were the parents, how would you want them to act unto you? And it says all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you. Do ye even so to them? Proprietors of schools and their students, if you were the student and those students were the proprietors, how would you want them to give you the value for your money, for the school fees? All things whatsoever ye would, that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. It's still applicable today. And then, as we think about the government, if you are the a man in authority, how would you want the citizens to act unto you? And all these things that we're writing in, in our newspapers about the, you know, the president and the governors and all that, without verifying. And then we tell all these big, big slander and lies against some of these people on top there. All things that she would, that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them, husband and wife. If you demand, if you are the wife or your wife were the husband, how would you have wanted her to act and to behave to you? And Jesus said, All things whatsoever ye would that men should don't you do ye even so to them. Church between the pastor and the members, if you member, if you were the pastor laboring, getting us the knowledge of the word of God, leading us in the way of salvation, should sacrificing your time. Sacrificing your family, sacrificing your talent, sacrificing everything you've got. If you remember, if you are the pastor, sacrificing everything, your convenience, your very life, and you lay your health on the altar, and then you are to serve if the pastor were the member, and you gave everything you've got, all your strength, preaching every day, sometimes three messages a day for a number of days, from one retreat to another conference, from the conference to the congress, and from the congress to the combined service, from combined service to Monday Bible study, and then to other things. If you were the pastor doing that, how would you want the member that is the pastor now to love you and to respect you, to honor you, and to pay back just a little thank you in attitude? A little thank you in action. A little thank you in your, your reciprocation. That's what it says. And all things, therefore all things, whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them, managers and subordinates in the places of work. If you subordinate, if you are the manager, the director, and the manager were the, were the subordinate, you manager, how would you want that subordinate to treat you? How would you want him to pay you the amount of money that you are qualified for because of the work you are doing? Therefore, think whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so to them. This guides our relationship. It guides our action. It guides everything. In fact, relationship between us and God. Relationship between us and God. If you are God, and God were the creature, 
how would you want your creature to be submissive to you to be obedient to you to be loyal to to be faithful to you how would you want somebody you have created to show honor and to show respect unto you and this is what is saying all things therefore that she would that men should do unto you do ye even so to them how long will you want people to love you how long will you want people to respect you in 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 many places in which way and in which place would you want men to love and to respect you and to show that you know you are worth somebody do you want somebody to belittle you look down you make you like who are you where you're coming from and to make you feel like you are nothing like a nobody no you don't want that anything you don't want other people to do to do you not unto them then jesus said this is the law and the prophets that's the point is this a summary and the conclusion of everything this law we're talking about and this prophet we're talking about this is a summary of the whole law and the prophets this is the law and the prophets for christians who will say that christians should not do unto others as they want them to do unto them it's still for today and it will be until the earth will get out of its place therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you do ye even so to them for this is the law and the prophets uh, we're looking at uh, matthew chapter 22 verse 36 in matthew chapter 22 we're looking at it from verse 36 master which is a great commandment in the law jesus said unto him thou shalt love the lord with the lord thy god with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind it says you will love god without reservation you will love God without restraint. You will love God, love God without restriction. You will love God without retracting anything. Every moment, every time, every day, you will love God with all your heart, not with half of your mind. Loving God half-heartedly. Loving God just part of the time with part of your resources with part of your affection with part of your devotion with part of your talent it says you love god with everything you've got it says you will you shall love thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thine heart if he is your god if he is your lord if he is your redeemer if you own him and accept him as your father which art in heaven it says you love him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind then it says this is the first and the great commandment stop there and think a little bit this is the first commandment was the first sin not loving god with all your heart all your soul all your mind it says this is the great commandment what's the greatest sin not loving god with all your heart all your soul all your mind deliberately withdrawing part of your affection part of your talent part of your skill part of your love part of your devotion part of your sincerity part of your honesty part of your submission withdrawing that from god that's a great sin the great command is to love him with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind this is the first and the great command and then he says in verse 39 the second is like unto it thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself if that is a great command loving god with all your heart all your soul all your mind and when you don't do it you are sinning then the second sin the second level of sinning is when you don't love your neighbor as yourself you don't want to sustain any injury when you injure your neighbor directly deliberately you are sinning because you ought to love your neighbor when you hurt your neighbor in his emotion deliberately 
in his life deliberately you, you hurt him in his finance deliberately you hurt him in his business deliberately you hurt him in his family deliberately you don't you don't want anybody to do that to you you don't want anybody to hurt you hurt your mind hurt your emotion hurt your personality hurt your business hurt your children hurt your family and when you are not considerate of other people, when you are selfish, it's a sin. When you are not thinking about your neighbor, when you are not considerate about your neighbor, when you are not merciful to your neighbor, and when you are only thinking about yourself, and you hurt people, and you hurt their personality, you belittle them, you insult them, you assault them. And you cause pain unto them deliberately. That is sin. Because then you are not obeying the commandment. You love your neighbor as yourself. When you hurt your wife. When you use some languages on your wife that shows that the woman is wondering that this man loved me. If I said that to him, how would he feel? If I do that to this man, how would he feel when you just overlook, when you just neglect, when you just abandon, when you just count and see, are you there? I don't know whether you are there or not. I just live my life. And you know, sometimes that kind of withdrawal can be very, very painful. And it makes uh, your thinking like, you know, even if you look at the Europeans, they love even their dogs and their cats. And he'll, and he'll pick up the dog and pick up the cat. And there's this interaction and touching, the touch of love. And when you cannot even show that kind of love to your wife and you neglect her, and you abandon her and you live in the same house but you are not in talking terms but you still claim to be saved and sanctified even filled with the holy ghost and also still a christian worker it's a sin because it says this is the second commandment and if you are not doing that you are sinning there's a second sin the first sin is not to love god with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind and the second sin is not to love your neighbor as yourself and when you are so selfish you can't get him money more than taking care of your children and the money is there in the bank but you will not close your children you will not educate your children if you were the child now your child was the father and wouldn't the child wouldn't you expect that father to take care of you when you don't show that love to your neighbor to your child your nearest neighbor the neighbor you brought into the world and the neighbor you should be caring for and the neighbor you should be you should be doing everything to satisfy when you don't do that it's a sin thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself it says this is the second commandment then it says on these commandments hang all the law and the prophets you know the law and the pro they are not destroyed no because it's the law of love and it's the law that tells us to have mercy and compassion to be considerate for our neighbors in um, uh, we're reading from galatians chapter galatians chapter 5 verse 14 galatians chapter 5 we're reading from verse 14 here is what the lord is uh, making clear to us in galatians 5 verse 14 for all the law is fulfilled in one word all the law everything we read we can sum up everything like this we can summarize everything like this it's, it's fulfilled in one word even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself just that just that every doctrine you're thinking about no divorce and remarriage just love that man love that woman as yourself what do you want the man to you know change the key of the house and pack all his things out. I don't want my man to do that. Can you do that then? Would you want the man to be the first person that breaks the covenant that you urge, that covenant of marriage? 
When he said, I do. And you said, I do. Would you want the man to be messing up with somebody outside and giving his heart and giving his hand to another person outside and giving that same promise to another person? No, I wouldn't want that. Why would you love do that then? Because the whole law is comprehended in this, in this one saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the law. And it is still operative today. And it is in everything that would, that's why Jesus said, Think not, are you born again? Think not that I am come to destroy the law. How can Christ destroy the law and then make us lawless? If the law and the prophets are destroyed, there will be no peace in any family. If the law and the prophets are destroyed, there will be, no, be no society that will live at peace. If the law and the prophets are destroyed, there will be no moral law. There will be no righteousness. We will not be able to live a convenient life. No, there will be no life. Everything will be anarchy and conflict and division and battle. We will not care for man. The life of man will be of no value. We will be living like animals, worse than animals. If there is no law and the prophets will be killing one another without having any feeling at all that's why it says that the whole law all the law is fulfilled in one word that is even in this thou shalt love the, thy neighbor as thyself and we come to acts of the apostles chapter 24 acts of the apostles chapter 24 we're reading from verse 14 acts 24 reading from verse 14 but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, and believe in all things that are written in the law and the prophets. Paul the apostle, before his accusers, he said, I'm an apostle, I'm a preacher. But even though I'm an apostle and a preacher, that does not release me from the law. And the prophets, he said, that I still believe it, all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscious voyage of offense toward God, God and toward men. Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscious void of offense towards God and towards men. I'm sure you've heard about restitution before. Have you heard about restitution before? Tell me out loud. Yeah. If somebody sold one of my books that I hold so dear, I'm looking for that book. And when I want to maybe prepare a message or something, I'm looking for the book. And then somebody are taking it away. If the person gets convicted and then he comes to me and he says, you must be looking for one book. Here is the book. I'm sorry, I'm the one that took it. I'm returning it. To that's restitution. I'll be so happy. You see, when you make restitution, it makes others happy. Restitution is the law of love. That you consider the other fellow, I took something away from him. And what I took away from him, I'm going to restore unto him. But restitution is not just returning book. If I took somebody's dignity away from him, I shall restore that dignity. If I take the honor that somebody has, the respect somebody ought to have, if I took that away from him, I hurt him. In fact, you hurt people when you take their self-respect away. More than when you take a book away. More than when you take their money away. When you take honor, respect, the dignity of man. When you take it away from man. And you look at the man and treat the man like an object. Like a material thing. Like something that doesn't have life. And you step on him and you commonize him and you belittle him and you look at him as if he's not created by god as if where are you coming from as if his excreta we should gather up and throw into the latrine when you did when you treat a man a woman even a little child like that you take his dignity away 
and it hurts. And restitution just means you love him now and say, how, how sorry I am that I took this man's or this lady's dignity away from her. And I call her a but that's restitution. And now you restore the dignity to her. And you restore the dignity unto him. Just like you return his money to him. Money is nothing when you are still taking the, you are still kicking him like a beast, like an animal. Money, the money you restore to him is nothing if you don't restore his dignity, his honor, his respect unto him. And so, Paul the apostle said, I'm still living by the summary, the climax of the law and the prophets that herein do I exercise myself, always to have a conscious void of offense toward God. God and towards man. And that's what the Lord expects that we should do. We should act to our neighbors in such a way that we'll keep their dignities with them. And then we we'll give them everything that belongs to them. Don't steal, don't take away from them what belongs to them. In Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Great question. Wonderful question. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? He says unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? Can you get rid of the law and not get rid of eternal life? Can you overlook, abandon the law and the prophets and not abandon eternal life? What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And then he said, what is written in the law? That means that law cannot, you cannot just overlook the law and the prophets and say, now, this is the age of grace. Is it not the age of eternal life? What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And he says unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he, and he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. And that tells us then to have and to enjoy this eternal life. We we'll call it salvation. We call it the new birth. We call it new life in Christ. We call it conversion. Whatever title or name, we call it this is eternal life. That you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And to love your neighbor as yourself. And that is what he said he read in the law. It has not been cancelled. It is still there today. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 17 and verse 18. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Think not. How are you thinking before? How are you living your life before? Were you acting as if there is no law, I can be lawless. Think not that I am calm. To destroy the law and the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you. Till heaven and earth pass. One judge or one teacher shall not pass from the law. Till all be fulfilled. The word is given to us now. And the word will appear. When we appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This word, the law and the prophets will be opened again. We are going to be measured and judged by this. The law of life, the law of love. When that day comes, how will you stand before the almighty God? Let's stand before the Lord now and then tell the Lord, Oh Lord, here we are. We want to be who you want us to be and we want to have the life we ought to have. We want to have the life of Christ in us. I want to have the respect for the almighty God. The honor for the almighty God. And we want to have the obedience to the word of God. Open your mouth and pray unto the Lord. Now you understand the way you think. Will affect the way you act. Will affect the life you live. Will affect your behavior. Will affect your interaction with people. 
the law and the prophets. The summary of that law, the summary of the righteous, the inspired writing of the prophets is that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's what salvation does for us. Salvation does not cancel the moral law. Salvation does not cancel the commandments of the Lord. Salvation does not cancel our responsibility, our duty. Because Jesus Christ came, Jesus was not lawless. Jesus was not disobedient to the Father. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Jesus did not contradict the law and the prophets. Jesus did not cancel the law and the prophets. And everything is summed up in love. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is the first command. And it's a great command. Failure to do that is a great sin. And Jesus Christ suffered himself. A sacrificial lamb. So that our sins can be forgiven. So that our hearts can be cleansed. And after we are cleansed, after we are forgiven. Then it brings us back to the very center of this demand of the living God. The law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. To so love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And to do unto others as you want them to do unto you. To be thoughtful of other people. Not just to step on other people. To walk on other people. To push other people down. To insult and assault other people. We're not thinking about how terribly you're hurting them. To be considerate about your wife. Considerate about your husband. Considerate about your children, to be considerate about your parents, to be considerate about your pastor, laboring, sacrificing, giving everything up for you, to be considerate if you are the pastor, sacrificing life, time, liberty and everything. How would you want the members to consider you, to relate with you? All things whatsoever ye would, that others should do unto you, do ye also to them. If the pastor belittled you, how would you feel? If the pastor insulted you in action, assaulted you in action, how would you feel? Do unto him as you would, he should do unto you. If the pastor publicly disgraced you in front of your subordinates, how would you feel? Be considerate, then you will not disregard, belittle, disgrace your pastor. In front of his congregation, his members, all things he would that men should do unto you. Do ye even so unto them. This is the law and the prophets. And all the law is comprehended in one word. Namely, saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Conversion will make you to live a considerate life, a merciful life, a compassionate life, a, a loving life, a life that shows honor, respect to other people. 
don't deal with people as if they don't have feelings. As if they are just material objects to toy with. The law and the prophets at home. The law and the prophets in the place of work. The law and the prophets between teachers and students. The golden rule. All things ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. All the law is summarized and comprehended in this one saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's Christian living. Think not. That I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I am not come to destroy. I have come to fulfill. Therefore I say unto you. Till heaven and earth pass. One judge. Or one teacher. Shall not pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Christ is fulfilling everything now in his body, in his members. Christ is fulfilling the word now through you and through me. Living the life that Christ would have lived. If he was still here on earth. Christ did not live a lawless life. He did not live an unrighteous life. He told John. Suffer it to be so. That we might fulfill all righteousness. That's what he wants of the body of Christ. That's what he wants of every disciple. That's what he wants of every child of God. To fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill the law of God. To fulfill the word of God. To be obedient to the word of God. That's what he requires. That's what he died for. That's why he offered himself a sacrificial lamb. Let the blood of Jesus so wash you, so cleanse you, so purge you, so purify you. That you will live as Christ's representative here. the law and the prophets everything is summarized in this one word thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself if you are not thinking that way living that way acting that way talking that way believing that way you are sinning You love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and the great command. And you love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments of love to God and love to man, hang all the law and the prophets. love supreme love of God and sincere love for your fellow man supreme love to God and sincere love towards your neighbor not putting yourself first 
putting others first. Thinking of others first. Not thinking of your convenience first. Thinking of other people's joy. Other people's happiness. Thinking of other people's desire. Others first. That's the law and the prophets. Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. No, I have not come to destroy. I have come to fulfill. Until heaven and earth pass. One judge or one teacher shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled.